Amrita for this lovely introduction you gave. Um, I'm happy to share about my city today and um, I hope you have a good uh, uh, good understanding about my city, Cochin. Uh, and so without further ado, I'll just uh, turn on my screen. All right, so uh, it's such an honor to be part of, uh, you know, uh, the Kaki Talks uh, program. Um, I've been a huge fan of Kaki for the last uh, four or five years, ever since my friend, who's also part of Kaki, um, took me on a on a private tour uh, through Mumbai and the streets of Mumbai, and it was an enlightening, eye-opening experience for me. And um, as soon as I got back to my city, I thought uh, we need to have something like this. And that's when I eventually started uh, something called the Kochi Heritage Project, and that has now brought me to um, Kaki once again. Um, I hope you enjoyed this talk. So uh, this is basically um, uh, one of the walks that I do. It's called A Queen's Story. And uh, it's basically the, the story of Kochi itself and how it got this name as, as the Queen of the Arabian Sea. Um, uh, not to take away from the people in Mumbai, but uh, uh, it, uh, Kochi has uh, this amazing distinction as Queen of the Arabian Sea, uh, which none of the other big port cities have. Uh, and it took a while to get this moniker and uh, it sticks on even to this day, bringing a lot of uh, travelers and tourists uh, to the city. Um, so to give you an understanding about the city itself, you need to go back to history and see how it basically transformed and uh, became the city that we know now. Um, so, yeah. So the questions right there, you can see, uh, what does the song in the movie Life of Pi and the specialty coffee brand in India have in common? So if anyone knows the answer, can you, can you unmute and share the answer? Wag Chap Chai. <laughs> what's, what's that again? Wag Chap Chai. It's a brand from Gujarat. Uh -huh. uh, no, not Chandra. really. Okay, okay. No, that's not the answer. Yeah, who is that? Amrita. Oh, okay. Good. So, um, anyone from the big cities, Bombay, Bangalore, Delhi, would be um, aware about this brand. Uh, the image that you see on the right is the logo of that brand uh, and it's called Blue Tokai. Uh, but um, have you ever thought about uh, what the brand name actually means, uh, you know, with its signature image that they have on all their packaging? So it's, it's, it's something that you find in the movie Life of Pi. There's a, there's a lullaby that, uh, that comes on at one point. And uh, the lines of the lullaby is basically uh, what the answer is. So Tokai is actually, for your information, is actually uh, old Tamil language and uh, it's called feather of or the plumage or the plume of the uh, peacock or the tail of the peacock. And it's generally blue in color. And so in old Tamil, Tokai was the word that was used um, to denote the tail of a peacock. And that is exactly what you find in the branding of this uh, coffee, specialty coffee brand in India. Uh, now, what is interesting is if you go back to about 3000 years uh, in our timeline that we have now, go back to about 1000, 1000 BC. And um, if you take the Hebrew uh, Torah or the Bible that you sort of know now, uh, it was written um, over a period of, uh, you know, 4,000 years or so. Um, but this part where they talk about uh, um, a certain king called Solomon um, and uh, the kind of uh, activities that he was doing. So he was building his, tem his temple and his city. And uh, he was collecting a lot of things from different parts of the world, uh, bringing in uh, gold, silver, and you know uh, precious metals and things from different parts of the world. Now, what is interesting is uh, the Hebrew Bible was written in Hebrew itself. So uh, there was no other language apart uh, you know, from Hebrew that was written. It was Old Hebrew. And the word that was given for a particular bird uh, in this part where they talk about uh, Solomon's ships going to a place called Tarshish, I think you can see it on your screen, uh, is the word for peacock. It's called Tukim in the Hebrew Bible. 
and uh, Thukim is nothing but the Indian bird that we talked about, the peacock, and the Tamil word Toke became Tukim uh, in the plural form uh, in the Hebrew Bible. So they didn't use a Hebrew word for it because they didn't have one. And uh, they just basically used a Tamil word that denoted this uh, bird which came from, from India. Um, and it is our national bird as of now. And um, this you find in a book hidden away in the Bible uh, written about 3,000 years years ago. So that is the word that that is being used by this brand. And it is basically our uh, cue for the this talk. So one second. So uh, coming back to the life of Pi, basically there is that lullaby. It is uh, it, uh, the song, the lyrics goes like this. Kanne kanmaniye kannurangiyo kuve mailo toke mailo kuilo kuvum kuilo. These are the first four lines of that uh, of the lullaby that you see and the translation is uh, right below it. Oh my love, oh the delight of my eyes, uh, would you not sleep my flower? Are you the peacock or the plumage or plumage of the peacock? Are you the cuckoo or the cry of the cuckoo? So uh, this line is what you find there and it's it again points to the Tamil word uh, that I was just talking about for peacock. Now, uh, to give you an idea about trade that used to happen, um, for a long time, trade used to happen from the east and the west, but um, we were really not aware about um, where certain things came from till about, uh, say, 2000 years ago, um, because um, trade was happening, but there was also uh, this mystique that uh, you know, there was a place far away called India and all of that. Uh, but somewhere about 2000 years ago, uh, this was broken and um, uh, the idea about the monsoon winds came to be known uh, to this Greek navigator called Hippalus. And um, apparently he found out that the monsoon winds basically work in a particular way and it blows in one direction for about three to four months. And then again, it blows back uh, in the opposite direction. And uh, with this, basically, he was able to uh, find the route uh, to this place uh, where it was wealthy and there was a lot of uh, precious things that can, that that could be attained from, and that was India. So this is an ad which came on um, Tata Iron and Steel uh, ad, which came out a couple of years back. And it talks about Hippalus and the wind blowing and uh, how basically it changed uh, uh, trade as we know uh, back then. And um, a lot of people from the West started coming to the East and uh, they were all basically uh, looking for precious things uh, which are only found in India and nowhere else in the world. So uh, Hippalus has got that credit. And uh, later during that period, there was also um, a kind of a book that came out. It was uh, it was it was a travelogue of sorts uh, written by an unknown author, um, and uh, it basically provides uh, a, a, an overlook about um, you know uh, about the Indian Ocean trade that was taking place ever since the the finding on uh, finding of uh, the monsoon winds and the Hippalus uh, winds came about. So it was called the Periplus of the Eritrean Sea. And Eritrean Sea was the old name for what is now called Indian Ocean. Uh, Eritrea means red. And uh, it's basically the Red Sea that they knew about. And they didn't know anything further to the Red Sea. And that was the end of it. Um, so this Periplus of the Eritrean Sea uh, was basically an eye-opener for everyone uh, during that time. And uh, it denoted many of the port cities uh, that were around the Red Sea and the Indian Ocean at that point of time. And um, over time, uh, a lot of places uh, came to be known uh, to the Western world. Uh, but with this book which came out, um, they had a clear idea of what to expect in these places and how to basically navigate to these places um, uh, from one after the other. And um, this is basically uh, uh, an image that is made from the Periplus of the Erythrean Sea. So I can see that's the it's the known world uh, of that time uh, in the first century, and uh, you can see India, you can see Africa, Arabia, a little bit of uh, Europe, and uh, and then further east towards China, and uh, all of these blue dots that you see were port cities that uh, you know the ancient world traded from. And um, there's detailed information about all of these cities in this particular book called the Periplus of the Eritrean Sea. 
And uh, you can see the west coast of India is dotted with a number of ports. And um, right there, the most famous port uh, at that point of time was what you, what you can see as Barigasa. And this is basically, uh, uh, you know, Baruk, uh, Brabukacha, as you know, that ancient port which traded. And then eventually it fell off. Uh, and the trade moved on to other smaller ports. And you can see, since uh, many of you are from Bombay, you can actually see uh, Kalyan that is mentioned, uh, which is in Bombay. Uh, and then the entire coast goes all the way down. And you can see uh, towards what is now Kerala, you can see three, uh, four famous ports. So there is Naura, which is now Kanano. Uh, there is Tindi, which is uh, uh, called Punani as of now. There is Muziris, uh, which is very close to Cochin. And then there is Nelkinda, which is uh, further south, uh, just beyond Alapi on that area. So this ancient book, which came out in the first century by an unknown author, basically shows all of these places and especially the west coast of India that uh, the ancient world traded from. At maybe about three uh, centuries later, there was another kind of a map which came out and uh, it is famously known as the Tabula Putering. Putingirinya. So, uh, in, in other words, it's called the Putinger Stable. And uh, the reason it's called a table is because back then the idea of the world was that uh, the earth was flat and it was not round. Uh, and so everything was like a table. So, if you go at the edge of it, you basically uh, go and fall uh, down the cliff. So, uh, the image that you see on the right is one end of this uh, Putinger Stable that came out. Uh, uh, in summer, sometime in the 3rd and 4th century. And um, right there at the corner, uh, you can see in, in grey, the, there is a markage that is given for Muziris. Uh, there's also Tindis, uh, which you see a uh, little north of Muziris, and then other cities and towns. Now, right at the top of the image, you can see the river Ganges. So it's basically in India, but in a different form as we see um, in our known times. Uh, and that edge of the world that you see on the right was basically the end of the world. And uh, um, Alexander the Great uh, and his main campaign was to go find India. And he wanted to go at the edge of the Ganges that you see there and proclaim himself as the emperor of the world. Uh, but he wasn't able to do so. Uh, and he had to return back. Uh, but what you can see is at that point of time, there is a famous place called Moses that is being noted. And um, uh, this was an ancient port. Like I said, in the Periphery also, there was a mention of this port city, uh, which is about 30 kilometers from what is now the city of Cochin. And uh, there is also a mention about this place um, in uh, Ptolemy's geography that he came out with. Uh, it's also mentioned by Pliny in his book, The Naturalis Historia. And um, Pliny basically calls it the primum emporium India, basically the first market um, and the largest in India at that point of time. Uh, now, the general notion of um, what we learn in history and geography is that um, there was obviously uh, the Silk Route, uh, but not all trade went through the Silk Route because it was very difficult to navigate the Silk, Silk Route. You needed camels and there's a lot of uh, um, uh, kingdoms and um, principalities that goes in between, you have to pay tax. And it was a hardest journey that one has to do if they had to transport something from the east to the west. So the easiest way they could do was basically through the sea. And uh, which is why um, sea trade uh, became very famous. And it was, it was used by many uh, more than the Silk Route that we know, uh, I always generally know about. And um, the Indian Ocean trade was flourishing from the east to the west, um, except for a few areas where there were pirates, of course. Uh, generally, the rest of it was navigable. And with the idea of the monsoon winds, it became much more easier for people from the west to come to the east. Um, so in Pliny's um, Naturalist History, basically, um, he learns about this king of Moziris, and, it is, and he calls, it, uh, calls uh, the king uh, the Selo Botras. Uh, now, this name is very clearly identifiable with uh, Ashoka's third inscription that you find uh, in Delhi. And um, it basically is the word Kerala Putra, which is the old name for the Cheras or the Chera Putras as they are known. So uh, we can easily identify Muziris with um, uh, the kingdom of the Cheras, which was uh, you know the southwestern kingdom that was ruling in the south 
uh, amongst the other kingdoms. And um, you can also see in this image on the right, you can see the Temple of Augusti. So um, we don't know exactly what this is, or we don't even know where this is uh, near Muziris. No one has ever been able to find out what it is. Uh, but uh, the conjecture of many historians and archaeologists is that it's probably a palace of the Chera King. Or it could be an Augustan temple uh, because uh, obviously there were Greeks uh, um, uh, that were coming to Muziris. The name Muziris itself is actually a Greek name, which I will come back to later. And um, uh, there would have been some rituals that they had to do before they leave for their journey. And so they had an August, the temple dedicated to uh, their first emperor, which is Augustus. Um, and or it could be a temple that belonged to the famous South Indian saint, which is known as Agastya. There's a, there's a mountain called Agastya Malay, which is um, near Trivandrum. So we don't really know, but it's interesting to see a temple that uh, with a name of uh, the first Roman emperor uh, right next to Muziris. And this is all in South India, as you, as you can see. Now, coming back to the name Muziris, uh, like I said, it was a Greek name that was given uh, by the Greeks, and there were these Greeks who were coming uh, for trade. Uh, they were known as the Yavanas or the Yavanar in Malayalam, and um, they called this place, which was otherwise known as Muchiri Patanam or Muchiri, uh, as Muziris. Uh, there is also a mention about Muziris in Jewish um, folklore. It is called Muiri Kod, and they have uh, um, um, uh, a copper plate which mentions uh, this place called Muiriko that was given, uh, gifted to the Jews from uh, by the, uh, the king of the Chairas at that point of time. Um, otherwise, this place was known as Mahodiapuram and it served as the capital of um, the ancient kingdom of the Chairas. So I don't know if you can see this image on the left. This is a Google uh, map uh, you know, uh, screenshot that you can see. Kochi is down south, that, see, that area that you see. Ernaklam uh, is also part of Kochi as of now because Kochi is expanded. Uh, but old Kochi is what you see, those two islands that you see at the bottom. Uh, and there's this entire backwater channel that you can see which goes up north. And you can see a place called North Paravur. Uh, and another place called Kurupilli and another place called Kutten Melikara. Now, the general notion or the idea of Muziris, as it is known now in the last 20 odd years, or maybe a little more, is that this entire area between North Paravur, Kutten Melikara, and Kurupilli is what is the ancient Muziris. Uh, but we haven't been able to find or locate the exact location of it. It could be anywhere around this. But um, archaeological excavations and historical toponymical hydrodynamic researches have proved that there was a part called uh, Patanam. So Moziris was also known as Mochiri Patanam. And there is a small area very close to that north, north Paravur that you see called Patanam. And uh, this is where uh, about seven seasons of um, excavations have gone, uh, have, have taken place, and they found... Um, 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 millions of small artifacts that uh, that are dated back to about 2000 years so uh, there were coins um, uh, there were beads there were shirts that were found out so there was a lot of things that were found buried underneath uh, in about 25 uh, uh, feet below the ground in this area called Patnam and the excavations were going on as of now we don't know much what is happening but uh, uh, it was done by an organization called PAMA P -A -M -A, and you can look it up uh, into the findings that they have uh, they occasionally have exhibitions that take place uh, in different parts of uh, India also um, so coming back to this place called Moseris uh, there's an, uh, this was the time in the first century uh, uh, where um, it was called a Sangam age. And uh, there were these gatherings that were done by uh, poets and scholars at that point of time. And, and they came out with uh, poems that were talking about uh, ancient South India. All of this was in ancient Tamil. And there was this particular uh, poem that's, uh, that's called the Akana Nuru. And it speaks about the ancient waters of Muzir. So you don't have to look at any Greek text or anything else. You can just look at our Indian Sangam uh, era writings and you can actually find a mention of Muzir again in this poem called Akana Nuru. And uh, it was written by this poet called um, um, Irkatur Thayan uh, Kananai. And in the 49th verse, uh, there is a mention about this place called Muchiri on the bank of this big river called 
Kali or Kuli. So this is basically, um, is in, in the image that you see, you can see right on top uh, northern Paru, you can see this water body that is flowing towards the sea, just near Putan Velikara. Uh, and it opens to the sea near, uh, just above Kurupili. This is as of now what is called the Beria River. And uh, if uh, if you are aware about the news which happened in 2018 and 19, uh, the floods that happened in Kochi was basically the Beria overflowing. And uh, all of those areas that you see around the Beria River was flooded. So um, there is a place called Alua, this is a little on the east. Uh, there is a bridge that is connect that is connecting from, uh, you know, between the river. And that bridge was basically underwater at that point of time. So you can see the, the ferocity of the water that came from Ediki uh, in the mountain ranges. And um, we'll come back to this flood again a little later. But uh, this is the Peria River. And you find a mention about this Peria River. And the Musiris was uh, right about where this Peria was. Now, over time, uh, the course of Peria has changed uh, into a different direction. So we don't exactly know how it used to... Well, it used to be back then, 2000 years ago. Uh, but of course, you do find this mention that Muziris was right at the banks of the Peria. Now, these are amphorae. These are actually these um, um, pottery that was found at Muziris, this place called Patna when I said, and this is done by the, uh, the group called Pama, and they actually excavated many of these. Now, what you see in the image on the right uh, corner you can see a bunch of different types of amphorae. Now, what is interesting about amphorae is that these were jars that were found in what is now Europe and different parts of Europe. And all the different designs that you see are from different areas in Europe um, around what is ancient Roman Empire and the Greek Empire. So all of this was found in Muziris. And different types of them, like the ones you see uh, on the right, I mean, on the right. And then at the bottom, you see a lot of other artifacts that were found. There was like a pipe that was found. There were other uh, skeletal remains that were found. And they were all dated back to about 2000 years. There were also coins that were found. Now, what is interesting is uh, uh, Kerala was a huge wine drinking crowd. They had a, a wine, huge wine drinking crowd 2000 years ago, which is why these all of these jars are found in this place called Mazar Muziris. And uh, uh, in Patanam. Um, and, and it's almost the same thing even now that if you look at uh, you know newspaper articles and reports, you find that uh, Kerala consumes almost the highest uh, average uh, in India. The alcohol consumption is quite high. And uh, 2000 years ago, it was the same. <laughs> so, so you find these wine jars that were brought in from Europe and uh, were consumed by the people of Muziris back in those days. And they used to bring this to buy pepper. So both of these commodities were luxury commodities at that point of time. Pepper was luxury, wine was also luxury. And you can see uh, that the Romans or the Greeks, they traded with this place in India, uh, bringing in wine and sharing pepper. Obviously there was a lot of other things uh, that were you know, part of it. There was, uh, there was gold, there was silk. Uh, but what is unique is these two things that you find. You find wine from Europe coming to India and you have pepper which is going instead back to Europe. Um, now, coming back to Muziris again, um, there was a finding. Um, uh, the image that you see on the right is actually an ancient papyrus, again, dated back to the second century. And uh, there was a famous ship called Herma Polon. So it is basically um, names of two Greek gods, uh, Hermes and uh, Apollos. And uh, this Roman merchant ship transported cargo from Muziris. And um, we don't know exactly where the ship went to, but probably to Alexandria, which is the greatest port of the Roman Empire at that point of time. And this Greek papyrus basically records the monetary value of the cargo assignment that was being sent from what was Muziris to um, Egypt. And uh, it included 167 elephant tusks, and which weighed about 3,000. Now, what is interesting in, in the whole detail, if you look at it later on, you will actually see this was all sold by one trader uh, from Kerala to some guy in Egypt and um, imagine 167 elephant tusks. So you can imagine the kind of wealth that people had in this port city and um, you can actually see uh, the value of the cargo that was there in that ship. Now, 
what is interesting is Moziris was, was active during this first century, the second century period. But you also find that Moziris declines um, right around the same time the Roman Empire declines. So the Roman Empire basically declines, starts to decline into 200 CE, which is about the third century. Uh, and then basically it, it just wiped out uh, by the 5th century in 476 AD. And it's about the same time that you find that Muziris uh, just went into oblivion after a while. It was uh, not, it, it became less important to people because the Roman Empire was gone. Uh, but at the same time, you can see that there was another port which came out further south of Muziris, uh, which is now called Kollam or the Koilon port. And uh, what is very interesting about Koilon is that um, uh, just a week back, we were celebrating Onam, and Onam basically denotes the first month of the, the Malayalam calendar. Now, the Malayalam calendar originates right around 825 CE, which is exactly the date that Kollam city was built or completed. And so you can see that Kollam actually, uh, uh, the Malayalam era calendar actually starts from the, the date that the city was born. And even to this day, uh, people from Kerala use the Malayalam calendar for obviously uh, different reasons, but uh, celebrate festivals and all of that. And it is called the Kol the Kolla Varsham, denoting the place that it's from. It was from Kollam. And even now it continues to be used by people in Kerala. So Kollam became a huge port uh, uh, following uh, Muziris at that point of time. And from the 9th to the 17th century, Kollam was a very important trading hub. Um, it was also the first port where the Chinese could come through when they came from the east. So they would first hit Colombo, Sri Lanka, Ceylon, which is uh, then. And then the first city that they would visit was Kolla. And uh, the Chinese used the port as a trans transshipment trans trans hub at that point of time uh, for their uh, shipments that went to the Persian Gulf, to Africa and uh, beyond that. Now, this period also finds the last of the Perimals, the 9th to the 17th century period. Now, the Perimals, uh, for your information, uh, is basically the, the name that was given to the kings, of, uh, the, the, the king of Cheras. The, they were known as the Perimals. So there's a nice book called The Perimals of Kerala, and um, you can read more about that. But um, the end of the Perimals happened during the 9th, uh, between the 9th and the 17th, uh, and, and this period, around the 11th century to be exact. And uh, power was dissolved into small um, principalities and kingdoms um, after their period. Now, the rise of Kollam and Kohikod happens around the same time. And there is another Kollam in the north of uh, Kerala, which is called Pantalayani Kollam, which is, a, which is now a place called Koilandi. And it's very close to Kohikod. And uh, it was a major center of trade with the Arabs and the Chinese. And um, as of now, uh, uh, most of the historians believe that Vasco da Gama landed at Pantalaini Kollam instead of what is generally known as Kapad. Um, and so this period between the 5th and the 14th century saw the arrival of three unique diasporas for trade. So you find Jewish people, Christian people and Islamic diasporas coming and settling down in Kerala to do business. And uh, the image on the right is basically an image of the oldest mosque in the Indian subcontinent. Uh, it was called the Cheraman Juma Masjid, and it was built in the 7th century, um, just at the same time as Prophet Muhammad. And uh, this is found very close to what is generally considered as Muziris. And um, you can find that um, a lot of changes took place during this time uh, after the Jews and the Christians and Islamic uh, diasporas came and settled here. And it brought about changes in economy, the society, the culture. Um, and the religion. So Christianity in India is, as, uh, is older than uh, what you find in Europe because uh, the legend has it that uh, one of the disciples of Jesus Christ came to came to India and you know um, spread the religion of Christianity in Kerala. And so uh, you, you, you start to see that there was a spread of agrarian settlements to new areas and there was an uh, increased emphasis on cultivation of spices and other cash crops uh, which came in during this era. Now, coming to the 13th century, you find Marco Polo records that Malapa, which is now northern part of Kerala, was dominated by the Chinese. So you can see uh, we were talking about the Egyptians and the Greeks and all of that. Now you find the Chinese very active in Indian and Indian trade. And even now, if you go to Koikur, which is Calicut, uh, you find places like um, Chinakota, Silk Street, 
ചീന ചേരി ചീന പള്ളി ആൻഡ് ഓൾ ഓഫ് ദിസ് ലിങ്ക് ടു ദിസ് ചൈനീസ് പ്രസൻസ് ദാറ്റ് വിൽ ബി ഫൗണ്ട് ഇൻ കോഴിക്കോട് ദിസ് ഇസ് വെരി ഡേ and this is another place that generally people don't explore much uh, so i would urge people to go and see koikot for its history now we come to this era now we were talking about the 9th and 17th century we come to the birth of cochin actually so cochin wasn't really known to uh, the old sailors or even marco polo or anyone who came at that point of time didn't know about this place for cochin so this image that you see on the right uh, uh, was done by a, a, a close friend of mine and um, you can actually see mozars right on top uh, but you don't see cochin on this map now the reason why you don't see it is because the ancient world till about the 14th century didn't have cochin or any of those places that is marked in blue beside the yellow areas so there's a place called triponathara which is uh, the old name was called trio perura and the triponathara was basically the edge of the sea at that point of time but as of now you have this entire area next to it uh that came out from the sea so uh, there was some sort of a catastrophe that happened uh in the year 1341 and just like 2018 and 19 the floods happened um you can probably imagine a much more larger scale um uh, a larger event happening and there was a great flood that basically um uh, happened in kerala you see kerala is actually a place with 44 rivers so you can imagine if 44 rivers burst burst out it would actually change the landscape and the geography so what basically happens is whatever blue area that you see on that image just came out from the sea in this year called 1341 and uh, this basically marked the beginning of cochin and uh, over time it became known as um, the pudu vaip era so just like how kollam became a city and uh, it became the malayalam era um a new era was born in the year 1341 and it is called the pudu vaip era now what is interesting is just very close to cochin we have a place called vaipin which gets the name from this pudu vaip era or that event that took place in 1341 vaipin comes from a malayalam word called veppu which means to place or to form and um, basically all those islands that you see in blue uh, were all formed during that time and took shape and the entire alpi area as you as you know now uh, uh, was basically came out to you know from that event so around the same time in the 15th century you have these ming voyages coming from china and um, 1405 was when they started these series of voyages to india and the persian gulf and to africa and uh, it was also in the same year in 1405 that Uh, a family called the Perumbadappu Surubam moves to Cochin and made it their capital so eventually this Perumbadappu Surubam becomes the Cochin royal family they are actually not from Cochin they are actually from the north of Cochin uh, further north of Mozaris uh, but eventually uh, they moved to Cochin uh, which is part of their lands and they settled here to make Cochin their capital this was the birth of cochin basically once the king moved here and a lot of other traders like the muslims and the jews slowly moved in here um cochin starts to show up on the map so um during those ming voyages um, there was a person called mahuan who was one of the sailors who was who were there on the fleet um and uh, he was probably the first traveler to write and describe about cochin so there were no written records about this place called cochin but mahuan basically first writes about cochin and um in the third voyage that is done by this person called zhang ho during that time in the 15th century uh, the chinese dynasty the ming dynasty uh, inter, inter intervenes between kalik and kochi which had intense rivalry and they granted a special status to kochi uh, and its ruler known as the keili to the chinese and um, what they basically do is admiral zheng zheng ho was instructed by the emperor the chinese emperor to confer a seal upon keili the king of cochin uh, and to enter a mountain in his kingdom as the zhengo zishan the mountain which protects the country so indirectly basically this ming dynasty was actually protecting cochin against uh, what is calicut or koikod at that point of time because both the rulers um, um, were rivals at that point of time in the 15th century so you see cochin becoming a protectorate of the ming dynasty in the 15th century uh, and then you know how history changes so uh, again the the latter part of um, the 15th uh, and uh, the 15th century basically uh, sets 
the exploration exploration age and you have spain and portugal uh, basically racing in uh, racing in time to find india they wanted to find the route to india because by then the entire trading route was totally monopolized and handled by the arab traders uh, which went from the east to the west and they were very active in trade here so the portuguese wanted to find a way and break through and you hear gama comes to calicut in 1498 and uh, the raja of perimbadapa uh, was quite uncomfortable being the subordinate of the zamorin the zamorin was the king of calicut at that point of time and so he receives the portuguese uh, vasco da gama and gave them permission to build a factory in cochin uh, so the factory would be just a, a place for them to stock their goods uh, pepper of course and spices uh, before it goes on to their ships and back to uh, europe um and so gama returns a second time and he forms an alliance with the raja of cochin who was very pleased to have the portuguese on his side and uh, the portuguese give him a crown that you see on the right a crown with 69 emeralds 95 diamonds and 244 rubies set in gold this crown can be seen in one of the palaces that is a museum as of now and um, portuguese basically helps cochin defend against the zamorin's attacks um, over the next um 100 years or so even more and uh, in return um the the portuguese were gifted this place called fort cochin as we know now it's a very touristy place as of now and this area called fort cochin uh, was gifted to the portuguese it remained european from the time it was given in the 1500s till 1947 so it was an exclusive european township that changed hands over time from the portuguese uh, but this is where the first portuguese fortress in india was built Uh, and that was right in Cochin, as we know. Now the Portuguese era continues. By the fifteen thirties, you have uh, the Portuguese eventually find Goa in fifteen ten and make that their capital. Uh, but at the same time, they build a city called Santa Cruz. So what you see on the right is the city of Cochin, Cidade de Cochin, and that small area called Fort Cochin is what you see there. Uh, this becomes the fort uh, for the Portuguese, and they hold on to it. um for about 160 63 years um the city itself was called santa cruz so even now there's a church called santa cruz uh, again bombay people can connect to this um uh, and uh, it continues uh, to be called the santa cruz church uh, but this was the ancient or the old name of cochin that the portuguese had given and even till the end of the portuguese period in cochin in about 166 years cochin was where the governors um, the portuguese governors used to live um um they would go back and forth goa and cochin but cochin was where they would actually uh, live and uh, the cochin royals eventually moved out of cochin after it was gifted to the portuguese and very close to it what you can see there's a small bridge that uh, that's across the river and the other side is actually called this place called martanseri and uh, the cochin royals moved to martanseri and makes it their capital the portuguese built them a palace over there and for the next uh 150 60 years uh the portuguese period uh, brings in a lot of impact in the culture the cuisine the language and the economy of kerala and uh, all of that lasts to this day even now so the language that we speak malayalam has about 200 loan words from portugal a portuguese uh, these are very simple words that we use in our daily lives and uh, they're all portuguese words that we use so portuguese language became the lingua franca and remained the diplomatic language of kerala um, the rulers of kerala until the arrival of the british uh, and so it is the british who basically turns it to english after that now this is a period after the portuguese where you have this dutch interlude and it's not really an interlude they actually um um, um are on these coasts for about 132 years so from 1663 when the dutch takes over cochin um this area called fort cochin which i said earlier the santa cruz area becomes what is uh, what became known as the dutch malabar or the dutch cochin at that point of time and for 130 years it remained in dutch hands and um, the dutch obviously um, were brought to cochin by a, a member of the cochin royal family who was not happy with how the portuguese were de dealing with things and so he personally went to colombo in sri lanka in ceylon and he invited uh the dutch to basically come and take over his land so you can see that earlier the portuguese uh, were invited uh, and offered land by the cochin king and then you have uh, uh 
another Cochin uh, royal family member who actually goes to the Dutch and asks them to come and take over Cochin from the Portuguese. And then uh, it eventually leads to a small war between uh, the Portuguese and the Dutch. And about a, hundred, about a year later, uh, Cochin becomes Dutch. Now, I've lost the slides, which I prepared um, due to some error. Um, so I'm going to speak out without slides as of now. So the Dutch period lasts for 132 years. And uh, um, this entire period finds a change in the trade itself uh, because the Dutch were very focused on trade. And it is during this time that the Dutch East India Company, as you know, the BOC, as they were called, um, became the richest multinational company in the world. So. Uh, it is the trade from India and other places in Southeast Asia that basically uh, brings this distinction, distinction to uh, the Dutch East India Company. And I ha I read uh, uh, a New York Times article which uh, uh, basically um, lists down um, the amount of money that the Dutch East India Company made. And if you put the top 10 companies in the world right now, multinational companies, it wouldn't add up to what the Dutch East India company made at that point of time. So it was probably the largest multinational company in the world, which spread all over Asia. And um, the Dutch were heavily trading with spices. So they had pepper, cinnamon, nutmeg, all of this was traded from different parts of India and Southeast Asia. And um, um, the image on the right that you see is actually from a book that was published or, you know, uh, it was a treatise that was made by the Dutch. So this is, apart from the trade and everything that they did, uh, this is a story of the Dutch when they actually came here, there was a governor called Henrik van Reed. So um, Henrik van Reed is very connected to Surat and you find uh, uh, the tombstone of Henrik van Reed in Surat as of now, uh, in the Dutch cemetery there. Uh, he was the governor of Dutch Cochin at one point of Dutch Malabar and uh, Apart from his duties with the Dutch East India Company, he was quite uh, um, a passionate botanist. So he used to study about the flora and fauna of Kerala and Malabar. And um, he he came with, uh, he was also, in, he encountered a problem that the Dutch faced, uh, that the Dutch didn't have immunity in India. It was very difficult for these Europeans to live in India because um, especially in Kerala, it was such a tropical, humid place. Uh, with lots of mosquitoes. <laughs> so so uh, you find the Dutch were finding it very difficult and they had very early deaths. Uh, so small children being born uh, used to die without immunity. And so he faced with a problem and he approaches the king of Cochin uh, to help him. And uh, the king of Cochin appoints uh, a few people from Cochin and from Matan City to help and assist him gather medicinal plants uh, that were being used in Kerala at that point of time. So Kerala is the land of Ayurveda as, as of now, and everyone knows about it. Um, but um, obviously there were medicines that were uh, you know, found in the forests and the jungles, and they were very good medicines at that point of time. Now, what is interesting is the medicines that the Dutch used to get in Netherlands at that point of time uh, was... Um, very expensive for them to bring 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 to Cochin because uh, um, there's a lot of journey to take place and then it takes time for all of this to come. At least three months it would take for them to bring all this medicine. By then, everyone would be dead and gone. So um, it was also this reason that he approached the king uh, to find out about these medicinal plants. And he found out that it is these medicinal plants, these medicines that, that make their way all the way back to Europe through the Arabs. So the Arabs are known as uh, very good concoctioners and uh, they used to mix uh, a lot of this. The word alchemy is actually Arabic, alchemy. So uh, they used to mix a lot of things and they are the ones who are making all these medicines and selling it in the European market for a very hefty price. Uh, and so the Dutch thought, why not um, take it from the source? So with the help of the King of Cochin and uh, um, individuals that were um, you know, helping him, um, he gathered about 700 different uh, species of plants that were found all across Malabar. And um, they basically note this down into an entire treatise called the Hortus Malabaricus. The Horti Indiki Malabariki that you see there is the Latin language. Um, so this entire treatise was created by the Dutch. It was printed in Netherlands uh, with the help of Indian medical practice practitioners and others who were involved in it from Cochin and uh, other parts of Kerala. And uh, this entire treatise is now basically the Bible of botanists. Um, and so the Dutch, even though they had, they were taking things from us, they also gave back 
uh, this study for us to, you know, even now it is it is known in the European world and the others that the study of Hortus malabaricus was indeed an eye opener for botanists and people who study about plants and about uh, Ayurvedic medicine. So uh, this was the Dutch interlude. Uh, now the remaining slide was after that. So the Dutch period lasts for 132 years after which you find the British coming and taking over Cochin. And uh, what happens is that slowly India eventually becomes British, all British. And um, it was in 1795 that the British take over Cochin. And for a period of about 30 to 40 years, they weren't really bothered about Cochin because they wanted to capture Cochin from the Dutch and they wanted to keep it for themselves. Uh, but they were really focused on building Bombay and Madras and Calcutta at that point of time. So you can see the birth and uh, the growth of all three other three cities that I mentioned now happening during this time in the early 1800s onwards. And um, Cochin basically lost its prominence in that early 1850s. But what is interesting is because Cochin, and of course, Mozaris was known for trade, there was obviously a lot of trade that was still happening here and there. And you find British merchants coming from Britain and settling in Cochin, obviously for trade. Now, it was during the Dutch period that the Dutch started with plantation agriculture and uh, there was an agrarian economy that they created over here. And obviously there was coconut and there was a lot of other um, uh, cash crops that were planted here and there were plantations across the state, across the place. And so um, there was an abundance of coconut at that point of time. And the British thought, hey, why not make this as our effect? And so you find British merchants coming and settling in Kochi and started trade. So this was in 1850 onwards. And, and then by the 1900s, the old port of Cochin was too small for this trade to happen. And so the British uh, basically brings another person from England uh, to look at uh, Cochin and see if it is possible to build a port. Now, it was of uh, uh, use for the British and for Cochin and for Travancore to have a brand new port because the ancient port was too small for the trade that was happening. And so uh, a person called Sir Robert Bristow, who wrote this amazing book called Cochin Saga, um, he basically comes as, uh, as a port officer. And um, eventually, after a struggle, uh, he gets a sanction from the British government and uh, they start to build a port. And this was a combined effort from Cochin and Travancore and the British government uh, to create this port, this brand new port for Cochin. And uh, as of now, if you look at uh, this place, uh, it is called Willingdon Island, and it is the largest man-made island in India as of now. And this is what uh, the port eventually uh, became. Of the ancient port of Mozaris, uh, Wellington Island became this magnificent port. And um, in 1947, once the, uh, the British left India by 1950, um, Cochin gets this moniker called the Queen of the Arabian Sea. Uh, but it went through a lot of transitions for about 2,000 years for this uh, for this name, to develop this name that even Bombay doesn't have. Bombay is called the Gateway of India, but it doesn't, it's not the Queen of the Arabian Sea. And it's only Cochin which has this dis distinction called the Queen of the Arabian Sea. And so you find that um, this port city eventually became uh, one of the top three ports in India, um, apart from the major ports as Madras, Calcutta and Bombay. Um, you find Cochin amongst that list in the 1950s. And uh, even to this day, the port of Cochin is very active in trade and it's a very busy port. There's also another port that's coming up in Trivandrum as of now. Uh, but the old name of Cochin, no Muziris, continues to live on, bringing in trade, of course, and a lot of travelers who come now to see Cochin. Uh, but uh, they, they don't know about this place called Queen of the Arabian Sea. And now you know that... Uh, it was this in this about 2000 years of history or even more than that that basically brought this fame to the city uh, and this is what i wanted to share about in this talk i'm happy to take any questions if you have uh, for the rest of the session thank you so much johan you've given us a nice lovely little capsule about the queen of the arabians uh, a couple of questions. Uh, you mentioned the Chinese influence and you mentioned the Dutch influence. Was there a significant Persian influence ever, considering um, that the Kolam place had some signatures in, in the Persian script? Yes, yes. So it's called the Pahlavi script. And so when uh, when I talked about Kolam being one of the new cities that were built after Mozaris, 
um, you find these um, uh, Christian, Jewish, and uh, Islamic uh, merchants coming and settling down in in this place called Kollam. And uh, many of the Christian uh, traders that came, they came from Persia, they came from Iraq and what is now Syria and Iraq and all of that. And they came through Persia and you find this Persian influence. So even now, if you look at Syrian Christian liturgy, it is actually in Persian, old Persian script. Yes. It's Aramaic that they use. And so you have a Persian connection as well that comes to Cochin through these traders. So could you give us the exact address if you know of where these column plates can be found? Uh, the column plates are actually, it's called the Tarisipali plates. It, um, it's at two locations now. And they are the okay. two churches. Uh, and so because it belonged to the Christian community, uh, it is located at two churches, uh, Sairo Malaba Church and the Orthodox Church that um, has these plates as of now. Okay. And so these were copper plates that were granted to them by the Chera King at that point of time. Yes. And, and where would one find that crown which you showed us? In which museum? <laughs> you mentioned the museum. Yes. yes. So the crown uh, can be found in this uh, museum called the Hill Palace Museum. It was uh, the last palace that was used by the, the Maharaja of Cochin. And it was eventually uh, given to the state and the state is converted into this uh, massive museum as of now. And in one of its chambers, you will find the gold crown and it's accessible to anyone who visits the palace. And, and doesn't the Hill Palace also feature in Manukala's book, The Ivory Throne? Yes, yes, yes. So yeah. that is the palace that he names. So do go and see it, everybody, if you haven't. Uh, let me look at the questions which are coming in. Yes, uh, Commander Mohan Narayan says uh, he believes that one of the biggest canards of history, one of the biggest lies, is that Hiplos discovered the monsoon winds because he believes that the Indians, Arabs, and Southeast Asian countries were using the monsoon winds well before the Christian era. It is, it is true, it is true. So um, Hippolos is credited with this. We don't even know if Hippolos is a person as of now. Yeah. So, uh, but obviously, like I said, uh, the the peacock found its way all the way to what is now Israel, and if they had it, it could make its way to Israel. Then it they had the people then had to know their way back to Kerala. So Hippolos is probably a myth. We don't know exactly, uh, but it's after the finding uh, of Hippolos that we find that trade booms basically, and so the Greek and then later the Roman Empire uh, uses these winds to navigate all the way to India and. Uh, the known India at that point of time, uh, uh, there was little known about India until the first century, until Alexander the Great came to India. Uh, but then right after Hippolos in that period, you find that uh, there is obviously a Megasthenes that comes to India. And there's a lot of written history that goes back from India to the other world. The date of 1663 that you mentioned will uh, find a resonance with the Mumbai Walas because that was the time Mumbai was gradually transitioning to the to the East India Company. Uh, the the trade off okay. had just happened two years earlier. Of course, it was formalized a little later. So, Bombay Walas, please note the Dutch connection. <laughs> so the Dutch were very very connected to Surat, which is yeah. very close to what is Bombay. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned many many ports on the western coast. Somebody yes. had a question, wasn't Lothal one of the first ports of India? Yes, yes. So Lothal is very close to what you saw um, um, as what is now known as Baruch or Baruch? or Baroda, uh, very close no. to that. It, it I, was, I think you mean Baruch. Baruch, yeah. yeah. So um, Lothal eventually uh, goes missing and then afterwards it is Baruch that takes its place. Uh, towards the first century AD and all of that. But Lothal was active before that. As far as I know, the maritime history of India mentions Lothal on the banks of uh, you know, rivers that flow to the Arabian Sea. Let's move onwards to see the questions. Being a Navy person, Commander Mohan Narayan wants to know how is the Valarpadam container port coming up? <laughs> so uh, I mentioned about Wellington Island. So Wellington Island uh, remains as the port, uh, remained as the port till about the 19th, the early 2000s, and then Kerala government basically built another port which is on another island as of now called Vallar Padam. Um, it is handled by the Dubai Ports uh, Company which uh, handles the port now. And um, obviously there's a new rivalry for 
this new port uh, down south in Trivandrum, where they're building a new port called Virginia. Um, but uh, Cochin hasn't lost its uh, its um, significance because the ancient port, the old port called Wellington Island, is now being used as uh, as a, a contain I mean, as a terminal for uh, ships that are coming to, to cruise cruise ships that are coming to Kerala. So it's a, another similarity between Bombay. Our, our old Bombay port has also become a cruise terminal. Cruise terminal, yeah. Uh, Maya wants to know where she can read about Portuguese words which have become part of Malayalam. Oh, there are many books written about this. So it, if you come to Kerala, we, the, the, the language that we speak itself is, uh, many of the words are Portuguese. Uh, but it will be nice to actually go through Portuguese Creole language, which was a language that was uh, that, con that continues to be used by Anglo-Indians who are living in Kerala. So the Anglo-Indians are not to be mistaken with English uh, Indians. They're actually Luso Indians uh, um, who are descendants of the Portuguese and then later the Dutch. And, um, and in, a, in, place, in places like Kannur, uh, there are anglo Indians that still kind of use Portuguese Creole language, which is again a mixture of uh, Malayalam and Hindi and Sanskrit and all of these own languages, Tamil and then African languages. Uh, but to read about these, um, I'm not really sure if there are any books about it, uh, but there have been researches that have been done by uh, people who've been studying about Portuguese Creole. And so um, there is another, there's a book called Song Without Shame. Um, which uh, which is a study on Portuguese Creole language. Uh, so many of uh, many of the accents that you find in Cochin and around, around Cochin are very closely related to Portuguese Creole language. So, is there a significant mixed race uh, uh, population in Cochin still? Of course, of course. I mean, if you look at entire Kerala, we do have a very mixed race between. Uh, but if you look at Fort Cochin itself, you have Fort yes. Cochin and White Pit. You find uh, the Anglo Indians as they, as they are called now, uh, descendants of the Portuguese, the Dutch, and then later the British who came here, but mostly the Portuguese and the Dutch. And uh, you, it's fine. It's very interesting because um, after the Portuguese period, the Dutch comes here, and then the British replace them. But the Dutch who lived in Cochin chose to remain back in Cochin rather than leaving the place. So about ninety percent of the population, the Dutch population, continue continue to live under the British in what is Fort Cochin. And uh, they eventually um, became known as the Anglo-Indian community in Cochin. Uh, but slowly, they're all migrating from this place. So maybe 50 years from now, you wouldn't find any of them uh, in, in Cochin or in Kerala anymore, <laughs> unfortunately. Tanjali has a question. She said she saw similar amphorae in Arika Medu near yes. Pondicherry. So what is the connection between so Arikam and Arika Medu? So Arika Medu was also another another of the sports uh, that, uh, that had... Uh, shipments that were coming from uh, the Greeks and the Romans. And you find many of these shards and, uh, you know, amphorae that you find in Mosiris or Patanam uh, in Arika Medu as well. So um, my best guess is that from Mosiris, there were ships that were going, going to the East Coast. Not so many, but uh, they had one point in the East Coast and they used to go to Bengal as well. So uh, if the Chinese were coming, they would touch Bengal and then the East Coast and then Ceylon and then to India, um, to, to Kerala. And Arikumeru was one amongst them that the Greeks and the Chinese used to stop at. Speaking of amphorae, Hamish suggests that the wine was actually brought by the Romans to consume on their long trips back and forth. It could be, it could be. So obviously they're used to wine and they would need wine and you won't find wine in Kerala. Uh, so, um, or they would have to have toddies. So um, it could be used by them. But it was also one of those luxury items that were being traded. So they would bring wine, they would sell it to um, the people in Muslims, and obviously they would buy spices instead and take it back home. So it could be either ways. Nilifa wants to know where she can see examples of the Pelvi script in Kerala. Um, so you find that certain um, old churches that uh, that were established by the Syrian Christians. And um, you find uh, some of it in Christian liturgy by in Syrian Christian churches if you go further um, to the east. So there are places like Piravam where they have a research center that is studying about Aramaic script. And they have a huge library, of course, uh, from those times. So um, they could connect with me and I could connect to them. And then All right, we'll, we'll share your number. Uh, Amrita, could you put down uh, Johan's email address in the chat box, please? Yes, yes. Uh, Madhu is asking, 
were there written records in India as much as seen in the West or was there a lot of reliance on oral records? Um, records uh, of, is there a mention of anything? Of, is... of history, basically. Ha, so obviously um, all the Indian or the records that were there in Kerala um, um, right until the, the Portuguese arrived have been lost. So uh, these were all, um, you know, uh, written on leaves and on, on these manuscripts and they're all they don't survive this long obviously with the human climate that you have here but it's only after the Portuguese period that you find that these records find a place and then uh, they had a systematic uh, uh, recording of the place the Dutch were very much into it um, and so um, apart from the sources that you find as Sangam sources as early as the first century you don't find much, many of the other records being preserved much and Eventually, you had to rely on Western or you know other sources to get back information from from here. So the question is about the Dutch interlude. What weighed heavy, heavier, the dispute in the royal family or the Dutch ambition, which was the <laughs> overriding uh, 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 consideration for the Dutch to come in? So, um, so I find that um, there is a, a theme that. Uh, that continues from the Portuguese and the Dutch and the British also later on. Uh, it is basically corruption that breeds this. And uh, you find that the Portuguese eventually, because of their trade links and everything, and uh, because of their position at that point of time, the people who were living here got very corrupt. And mm -hmm. the, the Dutch wanted to find a way and they were slowly growing. And they found that uh, um, the people in Kerala at that point of time weren't really happy. And obviously there was a king who was supporting the Portuguese. Uh, but the overall sentiment was against the Portuguese, Portuguese towards the end of the period in the 1660s. And um, one of the kings, knowing that um, this could be a chance for him to get onto the throne, probably thought that, hey, uh, let me go and speak to the Dutch and see if they are. And uh, the Dutch were quite strong at that point of time. The Portuguese were growing weak because of uh, situations that were happening in Europe. Um, uh, were also connected to these events in Cochin. So you find uh, there's a huge connection with how, what happens in Europe uh, and its effects happening in Cochin. Uh, and so obviously the Dutch wanted to spread their wings and uh, getting uh, possession of this ancient port of Moziris or something close to it would have been something that they had on their minds. Uh, but everything fell into place uh, with the king of Cochin actually requesting them to come and help them. And there was also a support by the Jews. So uh, the Jews were probably the uh, the, the merchants that uh, needed change the most and they were not really approachable. Um, I mean, the Portuguese weren't really happy with uh, having Jews around, uh, but the Dutch were okay with it. So it was during this period that the Dutch uh, period that you find that the Jews flourish in Cochin and in other parts of India as well. And so it, there was a hand of the Jews as well. Speaking of Jews, I think the answer is clear, but uh, Commander wants to hear it from you. Do they have a quorum in the in the synagogue in, in Jew town? Unfortunately, we don't. There are two last members. Uh, so we have we have two synagogues, active synagogues. One is the Paradisi synagogue, and there's one in Ernakul. Uh, but unfortunately, the quorum is not met as of now. Uh, there are people who fly in from Israel and other parts of uh, the world uh, and during festivals, but not always. So we don't have a quorum. There are only two members uh, in the Paradisi Jewish community and a, and a handful in Ernaklum. Uh, so there is no quorum. Could you tell us something about the debts that the Romans accumulated with their uh, voluminous purchase of pepper? Oh, uh, I think the entire collapse of uh, the Roman Empire is probably, uh, you know, linked to the debts that they had. And it was uh, this reliance on pepper eventually that you find uh, that the Romans use using pepper um, uh, to, to compromise on a lot of things um, on the war front it's in, in Roman Empire at that point of time. So they had huge debts because of pepper and a pepper eventually became so expensive during their time. So I don't know the exact numbers, but but yeah, the, I, I feel that the collapse of the Roman Empire is linked to, uh, you know, this yeah. excess use of pepper by the Romans. Uh, you mentioned that the that people from Muziris traded, traded with the people of Arikamedu through the sea route. 
But was there also any trading through the Palgar gap? Yes, yes. So you find, uh, I mean, the research is still going ongoing, uh, but there are obviously physical and certain evidences that show that there were trading routes that went through the mountains. So the Western Ghats, although it was a barrier for many, um, there was a smuggling route that used to go from Muzris to the back end and then goes all the way to what is Madurai and then Arikamedu from there. So, oh. so not much has been done because all of these areas uh, um, are now open to many and we don't actually go and look for it. But there are areas which, are, which is under the forest control as of now. And there are obviously dolmens and menhirs and, and temples and all of this inside these forests that connect to this period where there was a smuggling route that took place. And it went on even during Portuguese and Dutch times. So uh, you find that there was an alternate use um, and a route that was being used by traders um, through the mountains, Palakat Gap and on the others as well, through Idiki and the others. And now, as of now, as from what I've heard, this, this group called Palma, which did the Muzaris excavations, they're actually going through Idiki and doing more research to find this linkage that links to the East Coast, you know, uh, on foot. Uh, Palakkad, was it ever under the Cochin rulers or was it always part of uh, uh, the Zamorin's kingdom? Uh, it was on and off. But okay. so after the Portuguese rule and then the Dutch later on, uh, um, certain parts of Palakkad like Chitur and um, those areas came under Cochin's control. I see. Uh, so it was on and off, uh, but the Palakkad gap itself, uh, uh, very close to that is Chitur. So you find uh, the Cochin rulers have access to it. But also you find that um, Coimbatore was also very much linked to Muzaris trade. And so many of these Roman artifacts were also found in what is now Coimbatore. Oh. Mm -hmm. The question is, was local wine not available in Kochi that it was traded in place of pepper? Oh. <laughs> yeah, of course. So Kochi is not a wine growing region. Uh, you would obviously have uh, toddy that is made from coconut. Uh, but you wouldn't really find, uh, uh, you know, mm. uh, people growing um, grapes here. So it was not uh, logical to grow it here or have it from here. They would have right. to import it from outside. Kitanjali wants to know why the architecture is so unique and totally different from Dravidian temple architecture. Oh, that's a whole different question. <laughs> it's a, so uh, temple architecture in Kerala is actually very different uh, because there's a lot of other influences that have come here. So there's obviously a huge Buddhist influence, there's a Jain influence. Um, and also because these rulers were mostly very um, austere rulers, they didn't spend a lot of money on, on building big structures. So, um, and also, of course, um, most of these structures are built with timber. And so um, whatever the, the temples that you see, the old temples are all built with wood and they wouldn't have these large structures. They would need a lot of wood to build all of this. Uh, but coming back to it, so it is basically the other influences that you find in the region that uh, gives a different architecture style here, uh, that is different to Tamil Nadu or you know Karnataka, the Dravidian style that you see there. Is excavation still happening in Patanam? Commander wants to know. Uh, as of now, I don't think so. Uh, it was happening during COVID. And Pama was again involved in it, but there was a whole different uh, case that was taking place because of that. So I don't know if it is still taking place as of now. Uh, the seventh or the eighth season was over uh, during COVID and they found a very stunning discovery of it. Uh, they found uh, this um, this coin that, an, that had an image of a sphinx, of a Roman sphinx. And a sphinx is obviously a half animal, half human that is found in Egypt. And so this coin had uh, a sphinx that was found uh, in the ring of the Roman Emperor Augustus Caesar itself. So this was found in 2020 and there are some newspaper articles on it. But then since then, I don't think uh, there's been any explanations that has that taken place. Uh, Stephen wants to know something about the town of Pariyaram. Pariyaram, okay. Rama. Pariyaram is in Chalakudi. Okay, I, I'm not aware about this right. place. <laughs> you mentioned a lot of uh, people coming from the west and the east into Muziris. Did people mm -hmm. from Muziris go westwards, eastwards, what? Is there of course, of um, that kind I of mean, traffic? 
we don't have any evidence as such, but um, there would obviously be people going on board on board these ships. Um, and um, I think there is genetical evidence now that there are obviously people who went from India and settled down in Rome and these areas. Um, but um, to give it a hundred percent, I'm not really sure. But but of course, there would have been people getting on board these ships and going. It was not just uh, you know the Europeans or the Westerners coming here and then going back all alone. There would be someone or the other who, yeah. who would go. Even on Portuguese ships, there would be uh, one or two Indians who were uh, who would go there. And we have uh, written evidence of people who went and settled there and continued life over there. So. On a topical note, uh, we had in the Bombay papers today about excavations in Sanjan in the early 2000s. And there was similar evidence in connection with glassware from West Asia, from China, and other places, and even uh, the Roman Empire being found in a place called Sanjan, which is about 150 okay. kilometers north of Mumbai. I just thought I'd mention it because okay. it was in the wow. papers today. Oh, wow. So thank you, everybody, for attending. Thank you, Johan. It was really illuminating, and I think we got more out. We got a lot out of the questions and answers too. So thank you for that, and thank, thank you, you audience, me. for being such a great audience and participative audience. And do join us again next Saturday. You know what sort. Please do follow us on social media. Thank you. Thank you, thank, Johan. Thank you for having me.